Um, so this is, uh, the title of this paper is the title of the academic paper that I submitted, but actually the talk is um, because I was uh, kind of pre-chastised for having equations and, uh, and lots about the empirics that are no longer in the talk. Um, I'm actually going to talk about where it fits into the literature and, and have my attempt of uh, accommodating the, the wishes of, of Gloria, which is, is always a good idea. So this is joint work with Eric Muliger, my colleague at UC Davis. Uh, we've been trying to understand the demand for electric vehicles now for a couple years, and in particular, as we envision a future that is transitioning towards having lots of electric vehicles on the road, they're no longer just going to be driven by wealthy people in Palo Alto, right? We're gonna be thinking about expanding the market to reach low and middle income households. And so that's the, the topic of this, uh, uh, of, of this paper. So it's set uh, against a backdrop of very ambitious goals and targets that have been set uh, by national and state leaders around the world. Um, one of them, I, I just wanna call attention to a, a trend in uh, aspiring to ban the internal combustion engine. And I just, I, I wanna stick a flag in that as an idea that is, is not yet anywhere close to being feasible or, or even necessarily, like bans and mandates in general are, are things that should only happen really if we should kind of already be there. We're not quite there. Brown though has called, Governor Brown in California has called for 1.5 million EVs to be on the road in California by 2025 and 5 million by 2030. And there's a question, how feasible are these goals? What, what is it gonna take to achieve those goals? Well, one of the main challenges here is that electric vehicles are expensive. Why are they expensive? Because they've got batteries that are necessary in electric vehicles that aren't needed in internal combustion engines. The gasoline tank is the battery of the internal combustion engine. It's very cheap to make and so what you need is for the battery prices to be coming down in order to have cost competitiveness between kind of comparable products in the marketplace. Instead of that happening yet, I mean, that certainly is what's happening, that's the trend, and uh, people tell me that that's where we're gonna be in a couple years, or in a few years, but instead now, what has to happen is there are lots of subsidies, right, to overcome the fact that electric vehicles are uh, very uh, expensive relative to their um, substitutes, uh, states like California have set aside hundreds of millions of dollars to subsidize these vehicles and get them onto the road. Uh, same with uh, the, the U.S. federal government is, has done something very similar to the tune of about $1.5 billion per manufacturer, at least that's what's available. Okay, so these programs entail substantial costs, and recently, there was a proposal in the legislature in California to uh, allocate another $3 billion to achieve the 1.5 million EVs on the road by 2025 goal. And Eric and I were thinking, well, is that number realistic? And this paper, this talk, is gonna present our you know, first attempt at trying to answer that question. So, there are basically three things. When I started to think about the challenges of meeting the, uh, these, these goals in California, there are three things that, I, that came to mind. The first is that the subsidy bill may be very large, and today I'm gonna to present evidence of what we think that might be. The second is that, at least in California, electricity is very expensive, and I think as we consider shifting the transportation mix to um, electricity you know, sources, we wanna think about the price of electricity. Uh, just as we care about the price of, of gasoline for, uh, for um, internal combustion engine cars. And then I also was giving a little bit of thought to multi-unit dwellings and the role that they might play, so I'll mention that at the very end. <clears throat> so let's talk about estimating this subsidy bill. How do you think about the subsidies that will be required in order to get to 1.5 million EVs by 2025? Well, you have to have in, in your mind a model of what would happen in the absence of subsidies. We don't really have any evidence of that in California because there have always been subsidies, right? So there, the first thing is you need to, you need to take a, a stand on what the baseline pre-subsidy growth rate would be going forward. Uh, that's something that uh, is unknown, but it's bounded above by what we've observed. And if we think we know the demand elasticity, then we can uh, kind of back out a pre-subsidy growth rate based on that. 
Then what you need is an elasticity of demand for EVs and a rate of subsidy pass-through. So basically for every $1,000 that's being given as a subsidy, how much does that change the price that buyers pay, right? Does it reduce the price by 1,000, which is what we would call full pass-through, or does it reduce the price by 500, which would be 50% pass-through? Okay, so we need an estimate of that. The demand elasticity is, okay, we've changed the price of EVs by 10%, 20%. How much is that going to increase the quantity that we see purchased in the marketplace? There's very little evidence of this number. I cite a few papers here in the spirit of, uh, for, for Gloria putting what you're about to see in, in the context of the literature. Uh, these papers uh, are very good papers that have looked at basically you know, chicken and egg uh, issues relating to the charging infrastructure and EV subsidies. But Catalin Springle, Jing Li, um, Shan Jin Li, and others have come up with estimates of the elasticity of demand that are quite low, somewhere in the range of below one to, you know, in the mid twos. So just, I want to stick a pin in that. When we get to our results a little later, uh, I want you to come back to, ours are going to be significantly larger than that. Okay, so what do we do? How do we get here? We look at the Enhanced Fleet Modernization Program, which is a retire and replace program in California. It has a really nice feature of having, uh, having quasi-experimental variation that we're going to exploit. One of the challenges when you're trying to estimate the demand elasticity of anything is you need to know what would happen in the absence of the price shock that you're observing, right? We could uh, look at kind of California versus other states, uh, try to estimate this, uh, this parameter through the CVRP, uh, which is the main subsidy program, but we really don't think that other states are like California. So the thing that the EFMP program gives us is some zip codes are exposed to this, uh, this subsidy and others aren't for basically reasons that are related to the rules of the program, which we exploit as kind of quasi-experimental variation to get a demand elasticity. When do I end here? How, I'm trying to time, who's, who's got my time clock here? Gloria, that might be you. Oh, okay. um, 10 minutes. 10 minutes. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> That's a, that sounds great. Okay, so uh, in this program, if you're eligible for the part of the program that we're talking about, you get really large subsidies. So if you have an income that's below 225% of the poverty line, you'll get an extra $5,000 at the point of sale um, off the price of your electric vehicle. If you're between 225 and 300%, you get $4,000 uh, off. 300 to 400% of the poverty line, $3,000 off. So this is a program that's really targeted at low and middle income households in California, which is exactly the market that we're trying to learn about when we think about mass adoption of EVs. So that was really an appealing uh, feature to us. Just to give you a little frame of reference, 400% of the poverty line is about $97,000 per year for a, for a four person uh, household. So that's kind of upper middle class, maybe depends if you live in San Francisco, and they would, they would scream and kick at me saying that. But. Okay, so what are we going to, usually I have a pointer where I can kind of uh, illustrate a little di more directly the um, empirical strategy, but here's, here's a map of California, and as you can see, down the middle, there's a strip that's kind of shaded gray. That's the San Joaquin Air Quality Management District. And down in LA, that's the dense part in the, in the bottom, uh, bottom part of the, the figure, that's the South Coast Air Quality Management District. So things that are shaded gray are going to be zip codes that are in AQMDs that are participating in this program. The rest of the state, where it's white or light pink, is not participating in the program. So you've got AQMD1, AQMD0. Then within the AQMD1 and AQMD0, you have pink and not pink. Pink is associated with a designation of disadvantaged community. This is something I, I, I'm not going to get too uh, into, but basically, if you are in a uh, less wealthy, more polluted zip code, you're going to be in a designation of disadvantage. And if you're not, you will not be in that designation. So the pink gray, the pink areas in the gray AQMDs are the zip codes that 
are disadvantaged and that have uh, this subsidy available to them, the pink zip codes in the white area are um, the same kind of designation, but they just aren't in an area where you, where you can get this, where, where they're participating in the subsidy program. So you can probably see, just based on this des description, that there's a uh, comparison that's available to us here about patterns of EV adoption in those areas and outside those areas, and over time as this uh, policy was rolled out. Here's just the same, uh, the same map, but zooming in on LA, where you can see that there are a lot of disadvantaged zip codes in LA, the dark pink, and then some that are not disadvantaged, and then outside the boundaries of, of LA are the other air quality management districts that are, uh, that are surrounding it. So this is gonna give us what's called a triple difference approach, where we basically compare changes in EV adoption patterns in zip codes that are otherwise similar in areas that, that do or do not have availability of this subsidy. There are lots of empirical challenges that we try to address in the paper. Um, and I'm not gonna go into them, them here, but we actually, one of the nice things about a triple difference approach or even a difference in difference approach is there are diagnostics that are available to us that tell us whether the assumptions behind our estimates are valid. And so you can actually present some evidence that the experiment quote unquote worked, uh, which should give us uh, you know, some more confidence that the results are believable in this setting. And I'm gonna get back to that because Gloria also uh, pointed out something really important there. So using this as the setup, we're gonna take transaction data from the D DMV, and we know the prices of all of the cars that are sold in California from this transaction data, and we're gonna layer on top of it EFMP rebate data, so we know how much subsidies were given to a, a, a car type within a zip code in any quarter. And so using these, we're gonna be able to then estimate the demand elasticity and the rate of subsidy pass through, those two key parameters that are gonna help us to predict the subsidy bill. And I'm just gonna to skip to the punchline here, which is, um, which is this table that nobody can see, uh, so I'll walk you through it. Um, I didn't realize the screens would be so small, I should have like massive font. Um, so, all this is is a, gra is, a, is a table representation of what I kind of described on that, on that first slide. You have to assume a baseline growth rate in, uh, in the EV market were there to be no subsidies. And so we think, uh, based on our uh, examination of what's happened already in the market, that that growth rate over the next few years is gonna be somewhere around eight to 10%. It might be even slightly lower. The baseline no subsidy growth rate. And then, so that's what's going along the, the column headers. So you've got eight, 10, and 12%. And then we're gonna assume different elasticities. And we have a preferred estimate of these elasticities based on what I, the experiment that I just described to you. We think that elasticity of demand uh, in the EFMP program was 5.3. Okay, what that means is that if you reduce the, uh, the price by 10%, you're gonna get a 53% increase in uh, the quantity demanded. So this is a very elastic uh, market relative to those other estimates, which for those of you who really you know, are excited about promoting EVs, this is, this is a good news uh, story. But even with these, uh, that uh, very high elasticity, the subsidy bill that we're estimating here is very large. So we, uh, for a baseline growth rate of 8%, we estimate the this, this subsidy bill in California to be $20 billion between now and uh, 2025. If the rate is 10%, the baseline growth rate, that's gonna mean you need fewer subsidies to reach the goal. We estimate about 12 billion. We're still refining this analysis. These numbers you know, have not passed peer review. I prefer them not to be cited, uh, but this is our first estimate of the subsidy bill that, that will be required. And this includes um, all the subsidies that are available. So it wouldn't necessarily just be the state subsidies. Federal subsidies could defer some of that. Um, whatever the implicit subsidy from the ZEV mandate might uh, defer some of that as well. So I think there's gonna have to be some type of decomposition to really understand what this means for say, the California legislature and the decisions that they might need to make. I wanna make a couple caveats and then tell you also why these numbers are probably too low. The caveats are basically around generalizability, which is one of the things that uh, Gloria was mentioning is we took a nice quasi-experimental setting 
that is low income uh, zip codes in California under this retire and replace program that has certain features for eligibility. We're taking that estimate and we're saying, let's apply that as though it is the elasticity that governs the entire market. Is that true? Well, probably not, right? We probably think that there are gonna be some construct validity concerns around the way that the EFMP program was implemented relative to what might happen next. So we do really wanna be cautious about just plucking this number out. On the other hand, it's a well-identified number. We think that it actually represents what was happening in the EFMP program, and so there's some benefit to that as well. But you know, we don't just want to take this as the gospel truth. We need estimates from many other settings, as, as Gloria was mentioning. On the other hand, at every step of making this estimate, we use the most conservative assumptions. Um, so I, there are all sorts of kind of elements in which that, that's being manifested, but if you believe that this is the elasticity, and if you believe that the non-subsidy growth rate is 8%, then the subsidy bill is probably gonna be significantly more than $20 billion uh, because of the conservative assumptions that we were making. So I think I'm running out of time, but I'm gonna sp spend just the last couple minutes talking about electricity prices. Gloria mentioned that we are still looking at more, we're still looking for more evidence about how consumers value future expenditures on gasoline when they buy their, uh, when they make a decision about how much fuel efficiency to buy. I would argue that there is a growing consensus that is emerging that consumers value the vast majority of future potential fuel savings when they make those decisions. And that's what's shown in this table here, we don't have, or this figure here, we don't have to kind of discuss it in detail, but basically there are four papers, all of which are very well identified, they're published in really good journals, I find them to be the most credible evidence on this topic, yet they've all been published since 2014, and they're all saying that consumers value uh, they value the future stream of savings when they decide how much energy efficiency to purchase. What does this mean for electric vehicles? Well, we're really not sure about that um, because we don't know whether people are going to incorporate changes in electricity prices or electricity prices in the same way that they incorporate gasoline prices into their decision. If I ask people in this room how many of you know exactly what electricity price you pay per kilowatt hour, I would guess that most of you would get it wrong. I would actually probably get it wrong because it changes and we just don't look at it. It's not a big portion of our, uh, of our expenditure bill. But gasoline is. And if you buy an electric vehicle, electricity becomes more salient. So the question is how much are electricity prices going to matter? And I just want to uh, point out here uh, this map of the U.S., is pulled from a paper by Severn Bornstein and Jim Bushnell, where they just uh, show the marginal electricity price across the country. And you can see that in the dark areas, the prices are really high. So the electricity price in California is way higher than it is in many other areas of the country. And this is not a result of higher costs. Okay, this is a, or at least not higher costs of generating electricity or the damages that are associated with electricity. So this is because of basically bundling all of the fixed infrastructure costs uh, into the variable price. So the way that the tariffs are designed in California is different from the way they're designed in the rest of the country, and that makes electricity very expensive there. Is this going to be something that inhibits uh, the growth of the electric vehicle market going forward? Well, if you believe that consumers care about the future stream of expenditures, then the answer is yes, this will inhibit, uh, will inhibit the growth in this market. I'm not gonna get into this slide. I wanna just mention one last thing. I think Gloria's gonna pull me off the stage. Um, Multi-unit dwellings are something that people are really concerned about because you don't necessarily have a parking spot, a place to plug in your EV. As I started thinking about this in the context of meeting the 1.5 million ZEVs on the road goal, it just became clear to me that this, MUDs are not gonna be an obstacle to meeting that goal. There are th uh, 30 million 
cars on the road in California, you know, switching 1.5 million of those over to EVs doesn't require doing so for people who live in apartment buildings. Um, but we really care about equity. We care about market access. We care about environmental justice, these things. So I think that there are legitimate political reasons to care about this segment of the market, but I don't think they really have anything to do with meeting this 1.5 million uh, on the road goal. So that was just kind of a realization that I had that you guys probably all knew before this talk. And I'll stop there. Thank you very much.